Hello, History 72A, Winter Quarter 2024. This here is not a section, module, or lecture title. It is a set of themes that I've been trying to build so far in this class. Most of you have heard some version of the winner gets to write history, a saying which implies that what mostly shapes history is open conflict. You've also seen problems with historical monologues that go beyond just we won, we were the good guys, to see how monologues silence not just the voices of combatants, but of any group that ends up marginalized, including women and non-cisgender folks and the traditional of any group that constructed power in ways that did not serve, in the case of the history we're studying in this class, European power structures. The discipline of history, as of its neighbors, ethnology and anthropology, continues to reify monologues while at the same time in recent decades trying to excise them. Historical periodization has monologues so entrenched in its skeleton that quick removal would either require universal agreement and impossibility, let's face it, or risk making scholars unintelligible to one another. Historical periodization means how we divide up history based on events or society rather than on century or decade designations. The early modern period and the Enlightenment are named based on the changes experienced by only a subset of people within only a subset of people. In other words, they're Eurocentric and cis male biased. My period of interest is the progressive era in American history. It is named for the enthusiasm of one subset of Americans for improving or progressing society by controlling themselves and everyone else in very specific ways that often reinforced power structures, the very structures that they thought often they were pushing back against. Periodization is more subtle than overt, meaning open, winner, tell all historical monologues, but that makes the power structures built into periodization schemes even more insidious and difficult to root out. What I have on the slide here is various methods of periodization. The one on the left, prehistory history. Typically, the breakdown of prehistory and history is based on writing, which again is very ethnocentric. Some of these other ones, you can see this one, periodization of U.S. history, antebellum, early and late antebellum, and then broken down in other ways, and then broken down by presidents below. Looking at your quizzes, many of you, most of you, I would say, got the big point on the module title, that defining everyone in North America as either English or not English makes everyone in the not English category other, and seemingly less relevant in telling American history than the English. Some of you also got important points beyond that, including this title makes it sound like the English were confined only to North America east of the Mississippi River, which we know is not true. And a few of you noted that saying away from the English makes it sound as if the effects of any European colonization were confined to the area around each specific colony. This was decidedly not the case. And this is where the ripples come from in the lecture title, The Great Basin and the Utes, Ripples of Violence and the Other Slavery. In this lecture, we will think about the long-range effects of colonialism and violence, then focus in on the example of the Great Basin region, and finally look at the way that those historical ripples have shaped ideas across time as well as space. Native Americans were not one homogenous people, homogenous meaning all the same. But just as with Europeans in Europe, Native Americans were all connected to one another to varying degrees. Population distribution, resources, land use, trade, alliances, and enmities adjusted as groups of Native Native Americans were pushed from a place they occupied into the region of another group or groups. 
But displacement was one of many changes that accompanied European arrival in the Americas. Connections shifted if regular trade partners died of disease. And of course, disease did not require direct contact with Europeans to spread, only a human path out from one person to another. A change in one place would cause ripples moving outward that had the potential, even in the outer circles, to significantly interrupt societies and life ways. Native Americans could be profoundly affected by European colonization without ever coming into direct contact with any Europeans. I alluded to the effects of European colonization briefly in Lecture 7 when I pointed out that tensions intensified between Algonquin and Iroquois speakers up here as they were pushed into one another by European settlement and land seizure. And I just mentioned disease spread. Native peoples of both North and South America had trade routes that connected pretty much all groups to one another, at least indirectly. That's what you're looking at on the slide here. European colonization often cut off supplies in these trade networks, grabbing land, killing people, enslaving people, and so on, all made it difficult to maintain independent production after a while. Trade networks did not disappear, though. Some withstood change for time and some reconnected in somewhat different patterns, but more and more of them added items both derived from Europeans and demanded by Europeans. We saw the horse spread outward from Taos Pueblo after the 1680 rebellion to Plains and Great Basin Indians through trade. This went for metal objects and guns as well. Europeans were also not a unified group, as you know. We have seen Western Europeans were in conflict with one another before they began to colonize the Americas. Colonization was an outgrowth of European conflicts. When they got to North America, it was not as if the conflicts between Europeans stopped, nor were these fights irrelevant to the Native Americans surrounding European colonies. Western Europeans dragged everyone they possibly could into their conflicts, and ripples from one area interacted with ripples from another area in ways that were unpredictable because they involved people and not water. If the last slide of ripples with a single drop represented Columbus's first voyage to the Americas in 1492, effects on Native Americans began to look more like this on this slide pretty much immediately. By the end of the 17th century, the effects of European colonization on Native Americans were already heading past this that you're looking at on the slide. As ever, a 10-week class with a broad topic means that I could cover only a few snapshots here and there. I've been trying to give examples of different themes and dynamics as we move around the continent in space and forward through time. For this module, one theme has been outward and interacting effects of European arrival in the Western Hemisphere. And the story that I've been telling is of the northern part of New Spain, what would be for us the Southwestern United States and Mexico. In a prior module, we looked at early Spanish Native American interactions. In reading, you looked at part of the Gulf Coast involving multiple groups of both Europeans and Native Americans. And if you came to Dante's live lectures, you've also heard about this region. In lecture, in the lecture videos, you heard about the Pueblo region and the margins of Spanish control. The orangish color on the slide is is a bit more optimistic for the Spanish than reality. The margins between the yellow and the orange were never so precise nor uncontested as they appear in this image here. In the first lecture of Module D, we looked at the Viceroyalty of New Spain. The colonization of the Americas by the Spanish differed from that of the English in terms of time of initial colonization, geographic reach, approaches to Native Americans, and constructions of race. All 
European colonialism shared violence as a common denominator. And as European colonization increased over time, all European colonization developed hierarchically arranged categories of race with themselves at the top. The Spanish Costa system showed a greater fascination with and acknowledgement of reproduction between formative racial groups than did the English biracial construction. And you all have been doing a great job with that on your quizzes. The Spanish system still relegated all groups but supposedly pure Spanish to the lower reaches of society, with less access to power, less choice of employment or living space, and less safety than the top echelon. The systematization and assumption of legitimate or legally sanctioned reproduction represented in the Costa paintings was not a reality. But the prejudice against Native American and African ancestry was a reality, including in the less stable borderlands of New Spain. In the last lecture, I pointed out that the children of enslaved Indian mothers were even more vulnerable than legitimate children of the same casta, even though enslavement was not a heritable category in New Spain. In the last lecture, we looked at the profound changes in the Great Plains cultures with the introduction and dissemination of horses from New Spain, including the horses claimed and sold after the Pueblo Uprising of 1680. A group of Shoshone split from the main group and headed south rather than north, in part to secure more horses from Spanish settlements. This group became the Comanche, a horse-based Plains Indian culture who lived by a cycle of gathering, hunting, raising horses, and raiding and trading. As the soon-to-be Comanche traveled to where they would form Comancheria, they formed an alliance with the Utes, or at least the segment of the Utes who had also adopted a horse culture and become powerful through raid and trade. This lecture will be taking a closer look at the people of the Great Base region. To get you oriented here, New Spain was south of the map that you're looking at on this slide. Between New Spain and the Great Basin were the Apache. Navajo were west, and the Comanche ended up south and east. The Great Basin was not just home to the Utes, but to other groups as well. Societies that had become equestrian had battles with other equestrian groups and raided the non-equestrian groups. People in groups like the Paiutes and Western Shoshone did not see Spaniards directly unless they were enslaved and sold to Spaniards. Most of these people did not show up in Spanish records, as the Spanish really did not bother with the Great Basin. But the ripples of violence from Spanish colonization carried through to the Great Basin, as extreme violence became a fact of life in northern New Spain and the associated borderlands. The Great Basin is this region to the east of the Sierra Nevadas. Reno, Carson City, and Lake Tahoe are in this western corner. Death Valley is just at the southwestern angle here, with Las Vegas to the east at the point of Nevada, what is now Nevada. The body of water in the northeast of the basin is the Great Salt Lake, currently with Salt Lake City, which, among other things, is the capital city of Utah. If you're putting together the name of the state, Utah, and the group of people, the Utes, you are correct. Not all of the Great Basin looks as unwelcoming as this image on the right, but equestrian societies could and did push non-equestrian peoples increasingly out of more livable spaces and into regions where staying alive required both effort and ingenuity. 
non-equestrian groups were vulnerable to raids by equestrian groups and in a highly gendered pattern. Slaving raids focused on grabbing women and children from the Paiutes and Shoshone to take south to New Spain. That was certainly violence enough, but the violence that spread northwards through Native American groups to the Great Basin peoples from northern New Spain was extreme and horrific. And it shaped thoughts on life and the approach to war by equestrian societies like the Apache and Comanche, who occupied the zone between the Great Basin and New Spain. You may remember when we talked about the early Spanish invasion of the Pueblo people south of the Great Basin, that one of the original conquistadors sent to the Pueblo region was Juan de Oñate. You may also remember that in 1599, so about a century before the successful Pueblo Rebellion, Oñate retaliated for the death of 13 Spaniards by attacking and killing somewhere around 900 Acoma people. Surviving Acoma men over 25, Oñate ordered to be mutilated, and he sent others, women and children, deeper into New Spain as slaves. Oñate's own foot soldiers were accustomed to carrying out violence against Native Americans, but they also were expected to mete out violence to their own comrades. Spanish soldiers who tried to desert Oñate's force were mutilated if they had the misfortune to be caught. Eventually, Oñate became too violent even by conquistador standards. The Spanish government convicted him of using excessive force and exiled him from the region, but not until he had served as governor of Santa Fe from 1598 to 1610. You can get an idea of how excessive Oñate's treatment of Native Americans must have been to invite censure if we look at what was considered quotidian or ordinary day-to-day -day violence by the Spanish administration of Santa Fe. The Spanish commissioned equestrian warriors from groups like the Comanche to punish other Native American groups who displeased or threatened the Spanish. Punishment was mass death. And proof of success was the ears of those killed. The Spanish governors in Santa Fe after Oñate had servants or slaves string the ears together to festoon the entryway of the main government building, serving as a threat to all Native Americans living in or near Santa Fe. Incidentally, Oñate may have eventually horrified even other administrators in New Spain who didn't bat an eyelash at the strings of human ears, but apparently he was not too violent to be memorialized in Texas and New Mexico with statues made as recently as 2006. The national news has generally focused on the eastern U.S. and Confederate statues when they talk about the removal of statues that are meant to project power and hierarchy. These statues pictured were all sites of protest as well, and I know that at least some of these, perhaps all of them by now, have been removed. Statues like these that pay tribute to conquerors or generals not only accept but glorify violence against subaltern and colonized people. This, I mean, honestly, it's not as if the 21st century people who commissioned and erected these statues were unaware of Oñate's treatment of Native Americans. Oñate is known in history, first and foremost, for the brutality of the Acoma Massacre. It is not that all was perfect peace and harmony before the Spanish came, but just as enslavement in Africa was a localized situational phenomenon contained by societal systems before Western Europeans began to establish the massive transatlantic slave trade, violence in the region of the Great Plains and Great Basin had been localized, situational, and circumscribed by rules and norms. The constant overwhelming violence brought by Spanish colonialism, along with horses, metal, guns, and demand for both land and enslaved Native Americans, fed a world of unrestrained violence 
and cruelty. Equestrian Native American societies displaced Spanish violence on to non-equestrian Great Basin societies as part of an effort to ensure their own survival as they lived in direct contact with the Spanish. This um, image of this pot here is from the Great Basin and predates European arrival. Before Spanish arrival, there were both migratory and sedentary groups living in the Great Basin and the edges of the plains. Transportation and warfare were necessarily limited before the introduction of the horse to what could be done on foot or maybe with a boat and some dogs, meaning that ranges of land use and occupation were more limited and conflict over boundaries more localized and balanced than after the introduction of the horse. Equestrian groups, including the Ute, did not provide a buffer between Spanish colonization and Great Basin societies, but rather a means for the Spanish to extend both violence and control beyond the limits of what their soldiers could achieve directly. Spain did not, could not, invest enough in the northern borders of New Spain to make conquest of the Native Americans on the northern border of New Spain feasible, particularly once groups of Utes and Apache had fully absorbed horses, metal, and unrestrained violence into their lifeways. You may recall that the Comanche, as they grew more powerful in the 18th century, were just as willing to attack Spanish-Mexican settlements on the edges of New Spain as to attack other surrounding Native American groups. This held for the Utes and other equestrian groups in the 17th century as well. Raiding and trading became the center of Native American-Spanish relations along the northern border of New Spain. The the image in the slide, these are meant to be Apache represented here. The Spanish managed the threat to their own settlements to an extent by forming political alliances and trading relations with groups on the northern borders of New Spain. Generally, as long as the Spanish could fulfill their side of agreements with goods or protection, Comanche and Utes would direct Spanish technologies of violence against the Great Basin peoples further north. Spanish colonizers tried to monitor the flow of guns and ammunition with varying degrees of success, but did not try to regulate the spread of metal weapons, swords, daggers, steel-tipped spears, or of horses. This collection of metal objects that you see on the slide if you're watching was auctioned off recently by someone who raids Native American sites for objects to sell. It includes bullet casings, a metal arrowhead, a knife, and a metal axe head, among other objects like buttons and so on. Administrators in New Spain incorporated, albeit uneasily, the equestrian groups along the northern border of New Spain as traders, allies, slavers, and consumers of Spanish goods. These equestrian groups, in turn, organized their lifeways more and more around Spanish-introduced metals, tools, weapons, and, of course, horses. The system provided a balance of sorts between equestrian youths and Comanche, but proved catastrophic for non-equestrian Great Basin societies. Trading and warfare increased through the 1600s, as did the number of dedicated slaving raids. This is, on the slide is a gratuitous Indian pony picture because they're just so, so gorgeous. The successful Pueblo Revolt of 1680 pushed the Spanish south for a decade, but this did not translate into peace among Native American groups on the border between the Great Basin and New Spain. By this time, for Apaches, Navajo, and Utes, violence had become central to their highly mobile raiding and trading lifeways. In the decade-long absence of the Spanish after the Pueblo Revolt, competing Native American powers vied with one another for supremacy and survival, maintaining cycles of extreme violence. 
1693, the Spanish returned to a familiar world of conflict and ever-present violence. The landscape of alliances had shifted and shifted again with the Spanish return, but the basic dynamics of alliance protection and trading with the Spanish returned, meaning that from the perspective of non-equestrian Great Basin societies, violence and slaving raids that took family and community members remained unabated. Violence and devastating slaving raids only became more intense with the arrival of the Comanche by 1706 and their strong alliance with the Utes. As historian Ned Blackhawk has noted, in colonial New Mexico, trading and raiding represented complementary sides of the violent equation of Spanish-Indian relations. This equation substantially remade former networks of life and trade for Paiutes and Shoshone, who did not develop horse-based cultures. Horticultural villages along rivers throughout the northern border region were displaced and became wandering bands, rather than remaining either sedentary or seasonally nomadic. Note that wandering, moving in unplanned directions to get away from violence, is not the same as the predictable season cycles and spaces of nomadic life. As Spain and France extended their European conflict to the Gulf Coast and the northern border of New Spain, the equestrian groups of Native Americans were drawn into varied alliances with Spain, France, and one another. By the mid-18th century, mid-1700s, the entire settlement of the Great Basin, plains, and surrounding areas had been reformed. We will leave Spanish equestrian Native American dynamics in the mid-1700s for a moment and turn to look at the non-equestrian peoples whose lifeways became upended and unsafe despite the fact that they were not directly colonized by the Spanish. These on the slide are Paiute water bottles. They're ingeniously made woven basketry, and they were used to store and carry water. I found most of these images on auction sites that deal in Native American objects that have been looted from pre-19th century sites. As ever, I want to note that I am generalizing and telling a condensed overarching narrative. I am going to pick up with non-equestrian societies at the beginning of the 18th century and describe trends that increased over the course of the century. I've been talking about Utes and non-equestrian people as if they were completely separate. Reality was more complicated, but also makes more ecological sense. The Paiutes, Northern and Southern, remained non-equestrian, as did the Western Shoshone. Utes who lived in regions further removed from both grasslands and Spanish settlement remained non-equestrian. These groups occupied environments less suitable to equestrianism. They also lacked fairly direct access to Spanish forces and weapons technology, leaving them vulnerable to border groups who early on became well-versed in the use of horses and the technologies of violence. Spanish settlement eventually moved northward, and as it did, raiding pushed non-equestrian societies further to the north into land with fewer natural resources. At the same time, enslaved Native Americans became ever more central to both trade and diplomacy between the Spanish and the equestrian Native Americans, meaning that as resources dwindled for non-equestrian groups, the level of raiding and slaving they had to endure increased. Resources became increasingly scarce for the non-equestrian groups, but also for the groups on horses who pursued them. Land that had not been suitable for equestrianism had what little grass, game, and water resources it did have 
thoroughly consumed by slave raiders and their horses. The nature of Native American enslavement in this southwestern region was entirely gendered. The preferred captives for enslavement and transfer to the Spanish were young women and children. This took an enormous toll on family and community structures wherever the slavers struck. In this portrait here, you can see this young woman is an enslaved Native American helping out with a Spanish family. The Spanish bought adolescent Native American girls and young women for agricultural labor, domestic and reproductive labor, and for sexual comfort. Even before they were purchased, these women faced serial rape. The inconceivable violence of the region became even more displaced onto the most vulnerable as equestrian men faced a greater sense of danger to themselves from the advances of Spanish settlement. A number of sources through the 18th century recount that the public rape of enslaved Native American women offered for sale was a regular part of trade fairs in the New Mexico region. I'm going to quote Blackhawk here again. The serial rape of captive Indian women became ritualized public spectacles at northern trade fairs, bringing the diverse male participants in New Mexico's political economy together for the violent dehumanization of Indian women. This brings us around to the construction of race in New Spain and the way that it played out in the northern borderlands specifically. The violence and terror visited upon Native Americans also characterized the experience of settlers. Complex codes of honor and patriarchy developed in these borderland settler societies. We have already seen in the central part of New Spain that colonial hierarchies privileged the children of women who had been kept chaste, virtuous, and pure. Enslaved Native American women were, by definition of their situation, considered unchaste. Their children were stigmatized by illegitimacy as well as by casta. The children, as was often the case with their mothers once enslaved, lost any tribal affiliation. So they were disadvantaged in both Spanish colonial and in Native American societies. These mixed children, along with Native Americans who had lost tribal affiliation, but who had been freed by ransom or war, were grouped together as henisaros. You saw that word on the last slide, if my pronunciation is difficult to make out. While small children, henisaros were considered wards of the church. Once old enough, they were indentured out as ranchers, herders, and domestic servants in outlying Mexican settlements. As the number of henisaros increased in the borderlands, as a group, they obtained a mixture of privilege and stigma. Henisaros became a separate racialized group, not tribally affiliated with Indians, not Spanish settlers, and not Spanish citizens. They did, however, gain limited legal protections and access to land ownership because of their status as Henisaros. These communities formed the sort of buffer zone along northern New Spain that the Spanish had not been able to create with their own settlers and soldiers. Returning one more time to those residents of the Great Basin who managed to survive and elude capture, this required resourcefulness and resilience on a massive scale. But as more and more of what land they did have access to became claimed now by U.S. settlement in the 19th century, their descendants increasingly experienced poverty and restrictions on how they could survive. Among Anglophone, meaning English-speaking people on both sides of the Atlantic, ethnography developed as a field of study. Part of ethnography became anthropology in the early 20th century. People like the descendants of the 18th century Paiutes became categorized by white scholars as original, unchanged primitives without history of their own. While Comanche became the romanticized Plains Indians of white American mythology, 
the Paiute became the subjects of studies, including the photographs, one of which you see here on the slide, into what prehistoric hunting and gathering societies supposedly would have looked like. Never mind the fact that confinement on small bits of inhospitable land bore no resemblance to their historical environments. Never mind that, as you have heard, they certainly had histories. Far from showing lack of imagination and inventiveness, far from being supposedly stuck in a primitive past, Paiute presence into the 20th century reflected an absolutely extraordinary ingenuity and ability to survive. Far from being static and unchanged, the existence of descendants of Great Basin non-equestrian societies into the 20th century demonstrated an incredible ability to morph and adapt to new circumstances quickly. The image on the slide is a Paiute group near Cedar, Utah in 1872. Julian Stewart, an influential American ethnographer at the beginning of the 20th century, used the Paiutes to formulate a theory of what he called cultural ecology. This, on the slide, extremely simplified early version looks fairly innocent. Natural environment served as the basis for cultural possibility and societal formation. Seems straightforward, right? That seemingly innocent model underlies ideas like this on the slide, that society develops in predictable stages from primitive to advanced levels of increasing complexity. Complexity being defined in a completely subjective and self-serving manner by those who consider themselves advanced. Part of the view of ethnographers and anthropologists like Stewart was that hunter-gatherer societies extant in the early 20th century had been perpetually trapped at the primitive stage. Because of the environment they had occupied for time immemorial, the environment that in reality they had been successively forced into by ripples of violence produced by European colonization. History betrays the complete fallacy of an assumption that there is any such thing as an unchanged society. Unless history is written in a way that reaffirms what people with power want to believe. This is another reason to avoid words like tradition and progress and the unspoken assumptions and differential values that underlie them. Traditional, used to describe the practices of Anglophone, English-speaking people, suggests that the traditional practice is better or more appropriate than anything else because it was done at some point in the past. Traditional, when used to describe the practices of people othered by Anglophone societies, suggests that the practice is somehow stuck in time and not progressing. Whether something is considered traditional and worth preserving or primitive and backwards has to do with power struggles in the present, not with any accurate reflection of the past, other than that those power struggles are often brought forward. Progress implies the existence of set, predictable stages. Not to harsh on Karl Marx uniquely, but you can see that the assumption of predictable stages basically would give us the idea that we can see what will develop in the future. And as I have been stressing repeatedly in this module, historical happenings are contingent situationally variable in unpredictable ways, and never, 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 ever inevitable. Increasingly probable? Yes. Inevitable? No. As we head back to the Atlantic side of North America, into the 18th century, the Enlightenment, and the so-called Age of Revolutions, we want to keep in mind that events in the 13 British colonies in North America were not the result of a monologue shaped only by European power relations. And yes, I am calling out maps like this one that I'm showing you on the slide. You are a really insightful group. I suspect that I do not need to remind you 
that the American Revolution, like anything else in history, was neither inevitable nor preordained. I'm calling out white celebratory versions of American history here. And although I do not need to remind you, I will anyway for emphasis. The United States that did form was rooted in earlier racialized and gendered constructions. While we are looking at this slide here, I'm going to take just a moment to point out Saint-Domingue, which will become Haiti. And I am hoping, I've arranged with Dante and, and all things going as planned, Dante will give a lecture on in the live lecture discussion time on the Haitian Revolution in order to better contextualize what was happening all through this region and not make it all about the British. We will see hegemonic ideas about the correct behavior of women adjust with the Enlightenment, meaning they change, they're not static. But what we will not see is any sort of truly revolutionary change to power structures in the British colonies that became the U.S. In fact, Enlightenment thinkers pretty much updated and kept early modern ideas of inequality in the great chain of being. They just repackaged those ideas of differential value in the language of progress, nature, and reason, rather than in theological terms. I asked you for new Module D title ideas before I had really gotten into the lectures that tried a bit to balance out the Spanish monologue history for the 17th and 18th centuries in the western part of North America. This meant that while the English were decentered, they were often just replaced by the Spanish. The name here for Module D, this is actually an older one. Um, I've come up with new ones since. You all came up with some really good ones. I particularly liked the ideas of tapestries and mosaics, the weaving together, sometimes with hard boundaries, sometimes with soft boundaries. But the name that I put on the slide here a year or two ago is Developing Forms of Power and Inequity on the Western Side of North America in the Late 17th, Early 18th Century. Costas of New Spain, Equestrian Native American Societies, and the Historical Construction of Primitivism. It's quite a mouthful. And some of you actually commented that um, when you came up with your own titles, they also were quite a mouthful. My punchier title, I didn't put on the slide here, but as many of you noticed, I like alliteration or using the same consonant sound over. It is Colonialism, Conflict, and Endurance, Cultural Encounters in Western North America, circa 17th to 18th century. Key points of Lecture 16. Violence caused by European colonization moved in advance of actual colonists. Native American groups, including the Utes and Apaches, displaced the violence that they suffered at the hands of the Spanish onto non-equestrian societies of the Great Basin and the northern border of New Spain. In the 18th century, equestrian groups fought one another and raided non-equestrian groups. This violence emerged from the demands of New Spain for protection and enslaved Native Americans. The Native American slaving practices that developed in response to Spanish demands were both gendered, targeting largely young women, and involved horrific violence, including sexual abuse. Equestrian groups raided non-equestrian groups for women and children, forcing those groups to repeatedly move into regions with fewer and fewer resources for survival. Nevertheless, these people survived against all odds. Do not use the words traditional and progress in this class. They do considerable work in perpetuating inequitable power structures, and they are just the sorts of ideas that historians should examine closely. And I will say, I didn't put it on the slide, but that goes for the word primitive as well. I know I haven't seen many of you use that, especially since the very beginning of the class. So good for that. Don't start. Without extra commentary, I present for your consideration the Jeep Comanche, the Comanche helicopter, the Apache helicopter, and the Holden Ute, which as far as I know is only sold in Australia. 